Oh, I was muted. Yeah. There we go. Hello, everybody online. Can you hear me now? All right, well, good morning. Welcome to the University of Chicago Library. Um, my name is Ashley Goslar. I am an archivist here um, in the library in the Hannah Gray um, Special Collections Research Center. I am the MC for today's event, which is a part of our Library Futures speaker series. Uh, the series highlights innovative ideas in librarianship that are relevant to our current work or may inspire future strategic directions. This event is generously co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Cultures Reimagining the University Program, as well as uh, by the Department of Race, Diaspora and Indigeneity. We will hear more about the Reimagining the University Program from Dr. Gina Miranda Samuels in a few moments. First, I want to thank the many people who contributed their time and talent to bring our guest speaker to you, Chicago and to make this a successful event. Many people from across the library and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture worked together to make this happen. Uh, I want to single out Adrian Ho and Wakia Lilly from the library who led the planning committee. I also wish to extend thanks to the Department of Race, Diaspora and Indigeneity for their generous sponsorship. A few logistical notes, this is a hybrid event with audience members present in person, in the library, as well as online. If you are in the room, please hold your questions until our speaker has concluded her remarks, at which point you may raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you so, that, so that all can easily hear your question. Should I pause, John? Okay. Um, when you speak, please briefly introduce yourself. If you are online, you may type your questions into Zoom's Q&A feature. Uh, members of the planning team are monitoring Zoom and will ensure that your question is asked. And if you're watching the um, event online, please remain muted while others are speaking. I'm now going to hand the mic to Dr. Gina Miranda Samuels, who, who will say a few words about the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Cultures Reimagining the University Program. Dr. Samuels. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, it's an honor to be here. My name is Gina Miranda Samuels. I am the faculty director at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and I've also been over at Crown at the School of Social Work forever, so I won't even give a, a name for that. The Reimagining the University initiative at CSRPC started a very long time ago, um, with a Mellon Foundation grant to invite faculty to do incubator projects. And myself and a junior colleague got together, admittedly over wine sometimes at happy hours to sort of kvetch and vent about what it was like to be at this university, how we felt oftentimes smothered and squashed in our creativity and what it was gonna take as two women of color to survive and thrive here. And we decided that we wanted to, because both of us were doing work in trauma and with communities that had been um, disenfranchised, displaced, traumatized, how do we do that work as women of color and not re-traumatize those communities? I'm a member of the community that I study. How do we do this in a way that leaves people at least feeling heard and maybe at best and further along in their journey of healing? And so unfortunately she left to go to Harvard, but we kept our friendship and um, ultimately were able to have a grant sponsor, a first convening of what we were calling Reimagining the University. Um, and I can't even remember the, first, the, uh, the title that came after that, but you know, as academics, we always have that colon and like a really long, and so it does kind of probably doesn't matter. It was reimagining the university. And we had people from all around the world in Brazil, Colombia, all around the country to come in and really talk about what their experience was at their colleges and to a person, regardless of where they were from, there was this kind of continued theme of feeling kind of smothered and fighting and or just surviving or just breathing and all of these lost dreams that um, all of us had had and we sort of maybe sm smalled them down to tiny little hopes flicker someday after we get tenure or after we're full or after something happens or after our kids are older. So fast forward, I become director, faculty director at the Race Center 
And the Race Center had been going through a process called freedom dreaming. Is anybody here familiar with freedom dreaming? And yeah, some of you are. So for those of you who aren't, um, sort of a parallel idea to what our themes were at this reimagining the university um, convening, where to, to be in spaces like the University of Chicago, but like many places that are bureaucracies that operate with very heavy doses of white supremacy culture. In order to survive in these places, you get to the place where you're kind of like, that'll never happen. So you see the new person come in and they're like, let's do this. And you're the person who says, we did that five years ago. We did that 10 years ago. This is what happened, right? And I was finding myself to be that person as new people were coming in and I hated her, but I also was like, I don't, I can't, I can't risk getting hopeful again. So don't make me do that because it hurts. It's difficult. And so the race center was going through their own process of freedom dreaming as an alternative to doing, um, strategic planning. And so we all got in this room. It was a really cool place. Um, downtown and almost looked like a building, a, a space that was Willy Wonka-esque. So the couches were in these really cool, you know, patterns and purples and reds and very not University of Chicago color theme, right? And we were asked to speak to our younger selves and have pictures of our younger selves and um, dream without anybody squashing it. So admittedly, I spent maybe the first three hours of this freedom dreaming process silent because I knew if I spoke, <laughs> it would, that would come out. But after a year of speaking to people, we were able to write up our dreams and they became our missions and our uh, vision statement. And Tracy, I'm talking about the, uh, the freedom dreaming process. So this is our uh, executive director in the back, Tracy Matthews. And from that process, it um, came out like a phoenix rising, our mission and vision in freedom dreaming. So we decided that this reimagining project um, and initiative was gonna be a multi-year project for us to realize our freedom dreams and to open up that dreaming process to more and more people beyond just those that were directly a part of CSRPC. So I'm really honored and excited that we have you all as part of our dreaming process. And we hope that we can continue this process to expand and expand broader people and voices at the table to share dreams that we might not um, even be hearing. And I have to say, this is a this is a learning process for me to even know about reparative archiving. And so I feel really honored to, to be learning as I'm um, broadening this possibility of others to dream with us. So it's been an exciting um, journey that I hope continues forever um, and that we're able to, to broaden and invite more people in as we invite dreaming about different spaces that universities can make for for a broad and very wide spectrum of folks on our campus. So with that, I will turn it over to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samuels. I'm glad, thank you for setting the tone of we're, we're dreaming today, thank you. So our topic today is reparative archiving. What is reparative archiving? Reparative archiving is one approach to rectifying past harms caused by bias in cultural heritage institutions, including academic libraries and archives. Archives hold stories about the best, the worst, and the everydayness of humanity. Unfortunately, many communities are often erased or excluded from the mirrors that those in power hold up to the world in media, in monuments, and in the archival record. Use of the word repair acknowledges that our institutional systems have contributed to a brokenness in the communal act of saving and transmitting over time records of the human experience. Reparative archiving talks back to an inadequate historical record and reclaims a narrative that is inclusive. It is proactive and not reactive. It is deliberate. It is a reimagining of how we do our work. To paraphrase our esteemed guest, reparative archiving is a holistic approach to archival practice that normalizes acquisitions of the oppressed 
advocates for and uses primary resources that reflect all of society and disengages from record keeping that systematically removes or intercepts voices of the other. We strive to develop inclusive collections, services, and spaces across the library, including special collections. With this event, we hope to animate a larger conversation within the library and on campus about the importance of embracing and supporting reparative archiving at UChicago and across the profession. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Lael Hughes-Watkins is the Associate Director of Engagement, Inclusion, and Reparative Archiving in Special Collections and University Archives, a newly established position for the University of Maryland in College Park. Hughes-Watkins served as University Archivist for the University of Maryland from 2019 to 2023, and prior to this, she was University Archivist at Kent State University. University. Hughes Watkins is also the architect of a reparative archive framework mentioned in her article, Moving Toward a Reparative Archive, a Roadmap for a Holistic Approach to Disrupting Homogenous Histories in Academic Repositories and Creating Inclusive Spaces for Marginalized Voices. She has launched workshops that focus on this archival praxis, which centers on community building as a first step. Her research areas focus on outreach to marginalized communities, documenting student activism within disenfranchised student populations, and utilizing narratives of vulnerable populations within the curricula of post-secondary education spaces. Her most recent publication is a chapter in the upcoming book, Archives, Power, Truth, Fiction, from Oxford Press. Hughes Watkins is the founder of Project Stand, a radical grassroots archival consortia project between colleges and universities across the country to create a centralized digital space, highlighting collections, emphasizing student activism in marginalized communities. Project Stand aims to foster ethical documentation of contemporary and past social justice movements in underdocumented student populations. She also serves as a co-chair for the University of Maryland's 1856 project, which is a chapter of the universities studying slavery. And she is busy as co-PI for a grant from the Council on Library and Information Resources and the Digital Library Federation for a postdoctoral fellowship in data curation for African-American and African studies at the University of Maryland. Please join me in welcoming Lael Hughes-Watkins to the University of Chicago and to the podium. everyone's ready. <laughs> I always like to tell folks that I really like to take everyone on a ride and, I, and, and, and take us on a journey. So that is, all, that is always my intention. So I am a fan of the vinyl. And I remember in the 1980s, my parents putting on some Stevie Wonder. I can still feel that shaggy brown carpet in between the toes of my bare feet the, in the small dining room of my parents' earliest home rentals, listening to Stevie Wonder's Cash in Your Face. I was barely in kindergarten, but I remember clapping my hands in rhythm and adding some kind of neck roll. I couldn't give you any kind of critique of his lyricism or of his instrumental arrangement, but I just knew it moved me. Part of the lyrics. I graduated from How Are You. My job is paying good money too. And if you check my resume, you find they all wanted me to stay. While I can't take the time out to check your credit card because the computer just broke down today. Well, I'll stop by here tomorrow to complete our interview, but I know what you're gonna say. I know what your bottom line is. 
you might have the cash, but you can't cash in your face. Stevie Wonder's song came out in 1980 on the album Hotter Than July. While I can now clearly discern he is speaking to the housing discrimination facing, black, facing a black man who attended HU, who speaks on his good credit, trying to make the case for why he is worthy of being a tenant along with his wife and soon to be newborn baby, the lyrics continue to lament that despite his professional and financial gains, he might have the cash, but can't cash in that face. You don't belong here. The lyrics continue to allude to the housing legislation passed in 1968 as a reminder and a deterrent to discriminatory behavior he is facing as he tries to grasp the American dream. And yet over 50 years later, we have watched the dismantling of the legislation that Wonder ponders in his melodic, funky discourse. Wonder often identif identifies socioeconomic tools, tools of oppression, and dreams of freedom in his music, music. Whether it's living for the city or visions, as I grew up and no longer with the ears of a child and unvarnished innocence, his music still left me chasing something, the milk and honey <laughs> land. Still, there is an ongoing, unrelenting, systemic force and structure designed before my time and before yours. More than 105 years before Stevie Wonder wrote Cash in Your Face, a man named Henry Harvey was born in 1848. He lived in Spring Hill, Alabama until his departure or forced removal with a white man named Braxton Bragg Comer affectionately known as B.B., moves with him to Anniston, Alabama, who would go on to become the governor of Alabama from 1908 to 1911. However, Comer is named as one of the perpetrators of the Eufaula Massacre of November 3rd, 1874, where a white mob began shooting hundreds of rounds of bullets into a crowd of at least 1,000 Black men on their way to cast their ballots to exercise their right to vote. Details of this actual riot exist in the reports of committees of the House of Representatives of the 43rd Congress, 1874 to 1875. However, a search of Comer in the Alabama Hall of Fame for Business only highlights his efforts as a textile pioneer, despite also actively participating in the convict lease program. A history is broken down in the book, Slavery by Another Name, Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to the World War II by Douglas A. Blackman, where Comer is documented as actively encouraging authorities to unjustly arrest African Americans so they could be used as free labor. Henry Harvey died in 1937, but he would go on to have a granddaughter named Vera Mae Johnson. Oh, picture here. <laughs> Um, living in Detroit, Michigan, who in the 1940s walked confidently into the front doors of the department store called Hemahoe's, inquiring about the hiring sign in the window. Hemahoe's was located across the street from the famed Book Cadillac Hotel, which was known to host presidents such as Grover Cleveland and the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. But just as soon as Ms. Johnson walked through the front door, she was quickly told to go around to the back entrance. As a reminder, don't forget your place. Can't cash in that face. Ms. Johnson went on to have six children, two boys and four girls. She eventually became heavily involved in politics, running for city council by the 1980s, and her home became a hub for political local elites like Coleman Young, in Clyde Cleveland. She often took her children to hear Jesse Jackson to speak at local churches, but her political aspirations would go on to be sullied by prescribed gender roles, another tool of oppression. Vera's youngest daughter would marry young and move to West Philly with her husband and three children, a somewhat classic tale of searching for a better life, a city with seemingly more opportunities perhaps a better educational system, but it was in the late 80s, the move bombing 
had happened not too far from where they lived. The United States bombs a predominantly black community. The often, the couple often struggled between paying bills or giving their children imagination, a chance to see the stars through some thrifted telescope or maintaining their subscription to a magazine with coding for various computer programs because they knew the Tandy computer they scraped to purchase for the family was somehow connected to the future. Their determination would find themselves finally moving from a small row house with splintered floors to Ohio, where they got their degrees in computer science, published several books, and in 2015, five years before the summer of 2020, they were accepted into a conference held in Palisades, New York. <laughs> Traveling with their now married eldest daughter and son-in-law who drove down to support them in their presentation and watch them completely geek out and watch them take pictures of the Babbage machine in an exhibit space in the hotel lobby. They celebrated the conclusion of the week with a meal at one of the nearby malls. And as they were making their way back to the hotel, lights are seen flashing in the rear view. Can't cash in your face. They are pulled over and surrounded by six to seven police cars. Officers quickly come out of their vehicles, each with their hands on their weapons. And all the eldest daughter could think of, don't make any sudden moves. Remember Trayvon. Remember Tamir. Their eldest daughter watched her husband slowly place his hands in plain sight. And the same eldest daughter stands here in front of you today. Can't cash in your face. Multiply these stories of various versions or various versions by millions. We know these threads infiltrate the archives. And we know these violent depictions frame place, space, and positionality and societal structures. How is there not a hierarchy or levels to this? Academia, archives, and predominantly white institutions that celebrate white supremacy, that defy the acknowledgement of histories of entire communities, that remain resistant to embracing the whole ethos of what it means to engage in reparative archiving. And yes, it is reparative metadata. It is looking at the legacy finding aids, but it's also looking at your colleagues. It is also looking at your colleagues, your community that surrounds you, folks who grew up in West Philly, the alum member who wants you to digitize their collections about starting the first indigenous student-centered organization, or your colleague who exists beyond the boundaries of gender classifications that make you feel comfortable and say, I see you. I recognize your humanity by actions and policies that move beyond the veiled and empty gestures that instead disrupt generations of epistemic erasure, freedom dreaming, as Dr. Samuel said. How can I, we, trust this process, this age of supposed enlightenment in the archival profession, where we are deciding to question ourselves, question our praxis? How can we trust you how can I trust you to tell the story of my grandmother, tell the story of my father, my mother, and my three times great grandfather, if you are not willing to engage in the removal of systems that deny the whole, that continue to uphold the systematic marginalization for the dishonor, yes, I said dishonor, of preserving white supremacist narratives that engage in gatekeeping, restricting of access, that enforces a system of order through oppressive tactics. Isabel Wickerson, 
the author of Warmth of Other Suns and Cass writes, quote, Cass is a hierarchy, the subconscious code of instructions, presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups on the basis of ancestry, often immutable traits, traits that would be neutral in the abstract, but are ascribed life and death, meaning in a hierarchy favoring dominant caste, whose forebears designed it. A caste system uses rigid, often arbitrary boundaries to keep the ranked groupings apart, distinct from one another in their assigned places, end quote. So I'm workshopping some ideas with y'all today. Might I submit to you today the idea of the cast of archival erasure. Where academic institutions and predominantly white spaces hold the tenets as stated by Isabel Wickerson. But instead, the code of instruction is for the upkeep of the hierarchy designed by our forebears to engage in epistemic injustice within the archives, to ensure that B.B. Comer is celebrated despite participating in slavery by another name. Still, our archives will never hold the humanity of the stories of the men and women found in the mass graves in Sugarland, Texas. Texas, where 95 bodies of formerly enslaved people, 25 miles from Southwest Houston, who were forced into free labor in the Jim Crow era in a convict leasing program, just as Comer had done. Where are their stories? Where are their archives? What are the pillars holding up the cast of archival erasure? The first pillar, and just three. I think it's gonna need more. The first pillar, epistemic injustice, as defined by Miranda Fricker, is where knowers and knowledge claims are unduly dismissed due to an imbalance of power between knowledge claimant and an audience with the authority to legitimize the knower and or knowledge. Fricker also goes on to suggest that there are two forms of epistemic injustice, testimonial and hermeneutical. I want to focus on testimonials, which manifests when someone dismisses a person's knowledge claim based on bias, like genderism, racism, and classism. But there was a follow-up to the framework, a Black feminist and epistemologist named Christy Dodson, drawing on bell hooks. She created a third leg to epistemic injustice entitled Contributory Injustice. In the 2023 article, Epistemic Injustice and Legitimacy in the US by Leslie D. Gonzalez et al., they highlight that Dotson stressed Black feminist thought, suggests that contributory injustice is the active that active refusal to acknowledge, to learn, and to be taught. I wanna say that again. Suggest that contributory injustice is the active refusal to acknowledge, learn, and be taught. Willfully refuses to acknowledge and acquire necessary tools for knowing whole parts of the world. I submit that contributory injustice under the umbrella of epistemic injustice is at the heart or is the first pillar of participating in a cast of archival erasure. Oftentimes archives in predominantly white spaces willfully refuse to acknowledge entire communities and engage in dehumanization by using the white gaze or Eurocentric lens to uphold archaic, archaic systems of power. The second pillar, performative power. In this definition, revolutionary acts 
are sublimated through performative power. To maintain an oppressive structure, organizations and institutions must give the illusion of action and change by providing the illusion of power to marginalized communities. Whether it is the development of work groups, which we've seen that, whose recommendations are never implemented <laughs> to engage in reparative work, restorative justice, equity and inclusion, offer support for outreach and engagement that is not substantive, to hiring of diverse populations to engage what I'm calling Blackface archives, meaning minoritized communities are lured into spaces with the promise to lead institutional change to disrupt systems only to be the tool of oppression by the oppressor who uses their presence to make their actions more palatable. Performative power is the opiate used to silence and maintain the hierarchy with the false notion of progress. The third pillar, gatekeepers and gatekeeping. I know we all have heard of that. Gatekeeping limits access to positions and institutional knowledge that broadens knowledge and community access. Gatekeeping is the creation of codes, language that renders histories and record systems inaccessible to communities that would benefit from that access. An example is a restriction of materials that would make communities informed, tethered to a new knowledge system to foster understanding of past, present, and future, but obscured through poorly written metadata, making histories undiscoverable. It is a deprioritization of records for processing, is the omission of the existence of materials. It is the restriction of materials because of fear of demands of accountability, reparations, the empowerment to historically marginalized, disenfranchised identities, justice, socioeconomic mobility, wholeness. I am a broken archive, roaming seemingly in disparate parts and stories, working to find the cohesion, access to more knowing, understanding of my place, of where I fit, the stories of my elders comes in bits and pieces, fragmented oration, faded photos, and incomplete names, plantations known and unknown, dreams realized but not known, where others died on a vine or may live in me. I wonder, as I've grown up no longer with the ears of a child or an unvarnished innocence, Wonder's music still leaves me chasing something, the milk and honey land. Still, there is an ongoing, unrelenting systemic force and structure designed before my time and before yours. What is the archive? Also answers who we are outside of the system. And again, I will end with let's engage in freedom dreaming. I would like to thank my husband, Trevor, for listening. A new friend, Manny, I hope you're listening, for being a sounding board and giving me new knowledge. I would like to thank my parents, my grandparents, and so many of my elders, known and not known, because you were, I am. Thank you.
Thank you, Leo. Um, now is our time for questions. 1036, so we have lots of time, um, which is good. <laughs> I was hoping this was going to cause a lot. Yeah, we'll have a conversation. Um, John Young is monitoring on the computer for those online. Christine Colburn is ready with a mic for people here in the room. Um, maybe while people gather their thoughts and type their questions, I'll, I'll lob a question out for you um, just to get us warmed up. Okay, let me find it. All right, well, in a recent interview with the, the Mellon Foundation, you described the challenges of reestablishing an authentic relationship with community members. Um, you recalled working with one community member and said, quote, I did have a certain assumption that I'm a woman of color, she'll trust me. Instead, you were initially seen as an extension of the university and had to work slowly and carefully to rebuild trust. Um, so much of reparative archiving, especially the vital component of reciprocal, respectful relationship building, can feel culture uh, countercultural. Um, we're expected in our culture to maximize production in the workplace. We're expected to get results quickly and efficiently. Can you talk to us about how you hold space for slow archiving? Um, how do you balance feelings of urgency in this work with the reality that this work takes time? Um, um, that's um, such a good question. I know so many of us have been have grappled um, with that question. I I do I, I just believe it's necessary. Like there's no way around it. Um, in the introduction, you mentioned uh, my work with respect to a clear grant that we received, and the amazing Dr. Francina Turner, um, who's in North Carolina. She is doing the heavy lifting, the Lord's work of making sure we're able to do our reparative archives, oral histories project. If it was not for her singular being able to dedicate her time to meeting with alumni at the University of Maryland, reaching out to them, having conversations, she's had to pour through our newspapers, our, our student newspapers. She's had to pour through our yearbook. She's had to or through so many publications just to get that context and background and to be able to engage in a meaningful conversation with members from the UMD community. It's, there's no way I could have just integrated that into my time. <laughs> so if it wasn't for Dr. Francina Turner, we wouldn't have the now almost 60 interviews that she's been able to put together. And so, that is a tremendous effort and we have to be honest with ourselves and say this is about the long term, the long game and, and set those expectations initially. And if we don't do that on the front end, then we can end up causing more harm to just rush through that process and to break something that's on, break something further that's already broken. And so, um, I think about that because because of the work that she's done in creating those relationships, we've been able to invite alumni to campus who are willing to come to our exhibitions, who want to give us materials to add into the archives. And so she helped lay that groundwork for us. And so I, I just, you know, I owe a debt of gratitude to her. I, I feel like we owe a debt of gratitude to folks who, who understand that because it, it, it does, it takes time and we need to build that in part of our process and set those expectations early, early on. I hope that answered that question. Definitely question from the Okay, good. This question is from Eli Hubbard. Uh, Eli says, thank you for speaking to us. 
How do you see these theoretical foundations being applied by programs like Project Stand? How did your work with Project Stand inform this presentation? Mm, great question. Um, I do see Project Stand as a reparative archive in, it, in itself. Um, Project Stand focuses on um, the advocacy, preservation, the ethical documentation of student activism in disenfranchised communities. Um, as many of you know who are in the, the archivals, archive profession, archive land that may be in this room and online, um, just historically, uh, institutions have not paid much attention to the contribution of, of student of students done a lot of archiving around student life. Like that's not, we always were, what's the president's office? What's in this college? What's in this department? You know, that's that's kind of been our, you know, those administrative records with very little attention to detail when it comes to students who, in my humble opinion, the lifeblood, and this is why we're here. <laughs> and so um, I now feel like we're, we can say fairly within the last 15, I would even say 20 years, um, where we're acknowledging that student contributions are necessary um, and telling the full story of our of our institution. And so I see that as a reparative act. I see Project Stand as a reparative act um, of trying to fill in the gaps that were that have been historically um, in place since the beginning of uh, so many of our of our institutions. And so thinking about um, those pillars that I that I mentioned earlier, it's I definitely see um, the act of the ethical documentation of, of student records as part of that, of that easily part of that conversation as well. And I hope I answered that person's question. This next one is from Georgette Mayo or Mayo. I appreciate you stating and asking, how can I trust you to tell the story of my family? Paraphrasing. I ask this to myself frequently regarding processing Black archives. Mm. So I don't know if I could how I ask. I would say in processing Black archives. So I'm more, so I'm assuming this person is not a person of color. Possibly. I don't. Yeah. Um, that I mean that is a that is an on going question and conversation like who gets to tell this story who gets to re who gets to do this work um is this work that should just stay in the community um to mitigate any potential further harm further violence um further fears of epistemic erasure um so that is like uh that is an ongoing conversation i don't think it'll ever have a complete and final answer. Um, I think it, it goes back to the question that you asked earlier, as far as it taking time um, and building those relationships to see that you're gonna be a good steward, a person who really cares about, it's not about just the extraction. We've had these conversations before. It's not just about the extraction, let me get this into the archives so I can hurry up and put up a fighting game and say you're going to have an exhibit and have an outreach again and event and blah, blah, blah. Like you really care. Um, earlier, um, it was referenced about um, a situation, a little bit about a time when I was at, at Kent State University, and I've told this story in, in different spaces, um, where I was working with a community member from uh, McEl McElrath McEl community, um, which was a predominantly African-American community, came up during, uh, from Black during the Great migration um, and they didn't have like running water and sanitation for into the 70s. It was really a dire um, history. And um, I became aware of a member of the community that had records pertaining um, to the relationship between Kent State University and McElrath um, in, the, in the 70s and where students specifically from the black fraternities and sororities were going down into, into McElrath to help with um, tutoring of students for helping provide food pro um, programs. And it was a really close and, and long relationship. And so she had a lot of records pertaining to that dynamic between that community and, and the university. And so that's why I was brought in on the conversation and um, was like, oh, let's see if we get the records on Miguel Brass and see if, if she'll be willing to, to, to share those records. 
And I did. She was a black woman. She was an elder black woman. She was like my grandma's brother. So it was just like I just felt that vibe. But just like I, I referenced in in my talk, blackface archives. Oh, you don't have any street cred with me. It's like it's like it, it, it literally didn't matter that I was a black woman. It literally didn't. I had to prove myself to her. I had to prove myself. And it took almost the entire time, all five years that I was at the university for her to trust me and, and get, and at a point I didn't care. I was just like, I can't care about just getting the records. It was literally, I was calling her, just how are you today? And if I let too much time pass, it was like starting all over. Oh, I haven't heard from you. I'm like, I just called you a couple of weeks ago. I barely talked to my mother every single day. <laughs> you know and I had to you know like starting the engine up again um her name was Miss Mitchell um starting uh talking with Miss Mitchell but I I remember coming to her house um several times even my husband even got dragged into it we were checking in on her after work and especially it was during winter and could she get to her mailbox because she had medicine and she had to to get out I mean invited me to Sunday school I mean it was such a long <laughs> relationship and finally meeting her, um, some of our uh, older, her children who were adults. And I remember when she finally agreed um, to sign the, the deed of gift. Um, and even then, I'll have to say this, in this part I've never shared, there um, was a white student that was there that was doing work in the community center. So I had met her at the community center. And she, and she was doing community service for, for the McGowra Community Center. And after five years of working with her, she still, who, and, and, and not to be ageist, but I think I may have been, she was significantly younger than me than the young white girl. Um, she passed the deed of gift over to her and said, do you think this is okay? <laughs> oh gosh, I, my, my, my heart sunk. And and I just also understand is she was a different time and where white whiteness, no matter your age or no matter your credentials, it was just her whiteness superseded the relationship that I had built with her. Can't cash in your face. And so I had to sit there and wait. And she's looking, she's uncomfortable. She's just, <laughs> she's just she's doing it. She's like, that's okay to me. I was like, thank you. So I you know, you know, I'm not, I wasn't mad, but it did hurt. It was just like, I had spent so much time. And so, um, and so she signed it. And what was still, even with that, what was awesome, we had like a surprise event for her where we invited community officials and council folks and our, my dean at the time came and we had a big surprise for her at the um, community center and had an award for her and everything. Um, and she did not, she had no idea her children were there. And she had no idea that was happening. Um, and so it was a major celebration. And because of that, like during that event, like all the elders said, I got some stuff too. You should come over. I, re I got better things than she does. And it was like, <laughs> so it was, so, you know, I love my elders. And so that, that showed, you know, I had, again, all five years, I had to, I, I put in the time, I had to put in the time. And so, um, and so that, to that person's earlier question with, you know, whether you're a, a member of that community or not, I think if you show up like in that way, then it, it makes it easier to do that work when you're not necessarily a member of the community that, that you're, that you're um, in communication. In communication. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, my name is SJ Zong and I'm an English professor here at the university. So I'm kind of coming um, as someone who works in archives and teaches about archives, but not from the library end of things. Um, so I'm really invested in like the work that you do um, and how that kind of ramifies in the classroom. So I think my question is maybe coming from kind of an ignorant place, but um, 
in terms of just like picking up on your story, um, the moment of like the deed of gift, um, what does that look like and how does that work when you're, um, you know, acquiring things from communities and have you been in conversations about, I imagine there's a spectrum of like mm. the gift, right? Mm. And like, and it just sort of pulls at conversations about reparations for me. Mm. So I'm wondering like, what does that look like in your experience? Um, you obviously had, yeah, to like be in community for a long time to even be trusted. Um, and then I imagine like, well, don't imagine, but know that in many contexts, this looks more like theft, right? So mm. um, how do you think about that concept? Or I would be curious to hear any stories about that moment of when something moves out of the community into a university's holding. Before, before I end, I want, can I pull on the thread of reparate, yeah. the reparations yeah. part? I want to hear more about what you're, when you're thinking reparations, like in this context. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, I was just surprised maybe by the language of gift. So I would have, I would, uh, you know, hope or assume that there would be some sort of like offering or an exchange, you know, as mm. opposed to a gift, um, whether that's some sort of payment or um, negotiation of, um, with the community, especially when it's these like adjacent communities to the university that have probably been encroached upon in some way, shape, or form, right? At some time. Um, so yeah, I would just assume that there, there's uh, something that's been taken at some point historically. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that some of these, you know, gifts might seem small, but really would be huge, as it was clearly to um, this woman, you know, um, in the life of an individual or a family. So I think yeah do people ever get paid for these things and what does that look like um say your name again um sj zong sj zong yeah i hope everyone just heard that <laughs> i really because i am laughing inside but like it's a profound question because guess what the fact that you're saying do we pay people for their it is often you need to be paying us for this collection Mm hmm. Oh, you have to pay us because we have to do this processing and we, we are going to need more people to help and then it has to be digitized. So we're actually always asking for the community to give us money. Yes. And it's more than likely that I'll go back to Miss Mitchell, although that was a grander, important moment, but let's say we didn't have that moment where we're recognizing her and thanking her. It was something a little less pomp and stance. We may get that collection and then because some former alumni who has thousands of dollars supersedes what Miss Mitchell just gave us because they can pay us. So we're asking, we're asking for the gift <laughs> instead of acknowledging the gift that was just given to us. Um, there's a project um, at the University of Maryland, um, the Lakeland Community Heritage Project has been going on for a very long time. There has been some amazing people um, doing the work, but um, two of the leads, phenomenal, don't play around <laughs> women, Miss Maxine Gross and uh, Viola Sharps uh, Jones, and Ms. Maxine and uh, Ms. Violetta both sit with me on the um, 1856 project for um, university studying slavery. I feel like like they are conscious because like they will ask us the pointed questions that we're not always thinking about as being siloed inside of academia. Um, but when I first came to the University of Maryland, again, going back to Kent Cash in your face, seeing being seen as a, a extension of the university, Ms. Maxine was another person I had to build, had to build trust with. Um, but the late they I was asked to to come in because they have been digitizing materials pertaining to the Lake and Community Heritage Project for a very um long time and starting to build this um modest um collection. But there's this very fraught relationship between the university and this historically black community, urban removal, black people removal. <laughs> I want to define it. Um, and so there had been conversations about, well, now we're starting to amass enough information and materials. Where are we, where is this archive going? 
um, to live. And so it started to become a conversation. Well, it could come to UMD, although there were the local HBCUs were much more also in the in the race and leading um, the, the possibility. But um, it was we got into a conversation about the deed of gift. <laughs> about that about that document and I tried to write this really long thing because I think our need of gifts are not it's more for us in the profession and not for the people we're trying to have these relationships with and we put all this jargon in it and, and talk about copyright and intellectual property that they're probably like what are you talking about um and so really was trying to create a document that just was like Hey, Lakelanders, people could come into the archives and create a movie about your lives <laughs> um, and don't have to tell you if you <laughs> if you sign over your intellectual property. Right? Like I was really trying to put like all of what I could imagine as scenarios for them understanding what it means for your stories, for your histories to come to our institution. Um, and so there are, there are these conversations around reparations. We have learned that a lot of the black labor, especially in the, its earliest foundings, um, was from the Lakeland community. And so there is this dynamic of trying to acknowledge the difficulties of that of that relationship and we're I, I feel like we're at a place where we need to blow up what 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 those documents look like because it, it is written for us in 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 the profession and does not take into account of what the needs um of the community that we have again have caused harm and it and it doesn't it is about the positionality and I don't feel like we look at them at the same way like oh we're up here and you're you're giving us these little boxes. And so we we are really trying and with Project Stand, I have to say, that has given me the space to start to have those conversations about reimagining what our documentation looks like. And I have to thank the fellows that we had for uh, 2023, where I hope y'all go online and check out the zine that they did where they reimagined collection development policies um, and reimagine what that documentation um, looks like uh, because it is about it is a, a type of theft that has historically in some ways occurred. I'm sure y'all heard about um, Renty Harvard um, case where a family has been fighting for a very long time to reach to have the dogger types of their family member that was enslaved returned to the family. And so, and so I think that's probably scared a lot of us in the archival profession. Oh, we want to start giving back collections. Oh, well, you made money on those collections. Um, and so like, how do we get, what is the provenance of the materials that we have in our archives? That is that is something that, that I don't think we really wanted to have that conversation about how we've acquired some of the things that, that we've had. Um, but there does need to be an acknowledgement that the gift is not, this is the other way around. <laughs> It is the other way around. So I really appreciate that point of question. I really hope we need to have more conversations on that because that it has been a, the complete opposite of what, what has occurred regarding your question. And I hope, I felt that was long-winded. I hope I answered your question. Just about 11. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I don't I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, if you want to feel more, I am told I'm totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a more um, this one is from an anonymous attendee, who says. That was an excellent iteration of the underpinnings and pervasiveness of neoliberalism in both theory and praxis. Do you feel we'll ever, we'll ever get ahead of this mechanization? And what are some of the strongest barriers you and others face when attempting to challenge that from within institutions or primarily white institutions? As we were, we were talking, as we've been trying to talk about talk about re reimagining and freedom dreaming. I do not want to be like Dr. Samuel said. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> I don't want to be that person because I am 
my spirit, who I am, I am always glass half empty, not half full. My spirit is always like, I, there's no way I can do this work and not to be someone who always believes that there is better. Like I, that I, that is not core to my soul. But um, I think the fight will always be there. I, it's not going anywhere. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get too political, but I mean, when we think about the political <laughs> environment that we're in, I have colleagues that are in Project Stand who are literally having to change the language of projects with who's um, the hiring of positions have been put on hold. <laughs> and so all of the, the legislation that's, 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 that's coming down the pipeline that has been passed in some spaces. Um, I don't think, I don't think we'll get, <laughs> I just don't think we'll, we'll get into this, this place, this space where we can just say, um, I think we will always have to push. I I mentioned my uh, my friend earlier, Banny. We were having a conversation not too long ago where we can't let down our guard. The wolf is always at the door. The wolf is always at the door. You can't, like there's never going to be a time. And so when I think about the challenges at our institutions, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I was saying earlier, I was like, I'm losing my dean. I said, at 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 uh, the University of Maryland, and I don't know if she's listening today, but she was so instrumental to me being able to even have this conversation about my new job title and like really engage in a conversation of what this looks like for me. And so, if somebody else was in that role, would this have happened? I don't think so. <laughs> like I really don't think so. So I really think it, it, you know, I talked about positionality. I really think it's about the people who are in these spaces, who is the leadership at our institutions, who are the leadership in our governments um, that can really dictate what happens at your, at your, at your, at your institution. The people who, who are community with you, it cannot be a person of one just because if I leave or someone else leave, it cannot fall. It has to be system. The change has to be systemic, because just one person, then it, then everything fails. It cannot happen that way, and that is that is an ongoing challenge. That is not that the change is not built in. That it's that it's always a a person or a few trying um, to engage in these revolutionary um, acts, and so that's why. Um, to, to me, those are some of the challenges and why is this going to be, it'll continue to, to, to be ongoing. I, again, I'm not trying to be negative, but it's, I, I just think the fight is always going to be there, unfortunately. There was a person in the back. Um... <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. My name is Jonathan Wegner. I am a doctoral candidate at the Divinity School here, and I'm currently working on my dissertation. Uh, I come uh, wondering what consolation you would offer uh, students here who come from um, historically marginalized backgrounds, directly affected uh, in, in various ways uh, by the sorts of uh, racism that the University of Chicago has engaged in or uh, adjacent communities. Um, I've done a lot of work to raise awareness about the, the, uh, at the article written about Harold Swift that's still sponsored by the university library when in fact actual historical scholarship, including scholarship published by the University of Chicago Press, such as The Making of the Second Ghetto, which is a critically acclaimed book, including the book um, Segregation, uh, uh, um, Richard Rothstein's book, what's the name of that book? Um, um, uh, can't quite think of it, but someone can someone can look look his name up. Or Richard Rothstein, Rothstein, I believe, documented the role of Harold Swift in the 1930s and 40s in establishing racial segregation here and using using racially restrictive covenants and throwing out 
uh, black and, and to a lesser extent, brown people who lived around the university. And yet the University of Chicago Library, which claims to care about the truth, claims to care about the truth, still has a sanitized and one-sided, one-sided article up about Harold H. Swift because he's a donor, really. And so, I mean, let's, fa let's be honest. And so the university has to capitulate and, and can't even take into account the findings of scholarship made by its own press. So how, what consolation do you have for people like me for whom this is not an academic matter, this is existential? Jonathan, I don't know who will answer that in the next couple of minutes, but I pre I, I deeply, deeply appreciate uh that question. And that is a conversation not just here, but that is something that is that that institutions around this country have to to grapple with and try to figure out how they take accountability. Um at the University of Maryland, we definitely have the names of uh, enslavers or, or past uh, slaveholders on 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 uh, on our buildings. Um, there was a huge uh, protest before I started at the University of Maryland for the removal of the name of uh, one of our former presidents, Bird, a uh, hair uh, uh, curly bird, affectionately known as curly bird. Um, and we have a massive collection of President Bird and at our university. Um, but there was a major fight to have his name removed. Um, he was a huge segregationist. Like, well, after segregation, wasn't even cute anymore. And he was still trying to, to promote it. And so um, we, part of the things that they, that was put as part of the conversation at the University of Maryland was that, well, the name got removed, but then we still have an exhibition about Curly Bird in the library <laughs> to capitulate <laughs> to those who were angry about his name being removed from the university. And yes, um, the money that comes to our institutions, I'm sure you can find a bunch of names <laughs> with a bunch of troubling histories that are tied here or at other institutions, at other spaces. And it, it, it can, cannot, I cannot, dis, I cannot disagree with you. As someone who's, again, a, a, the chair of the 1856 project um, for university studying slavery, we, we have an um, entry space to our institution where it's called the Founders Panel. And it has all these names of the people who started the institution, it's like this, this celebration, this this acknowledgement, this honor that their names are there, and when you when we started doing the digging, pretty much if not all of them <laughs> have ties to the to the slave economy, um, and so but they're there as like like us holding them up that they helped start start the institution, and so it is a it, that is it is a long it is going to that is a difficult and uncomfortable and i'm i will say i'm glad that you're you're causing attention to it and at least it will continue to hopefully cause discourse and conversation and how do we have how do we move forward and mediate um ongoing harms and these these evil and challenging histories that are still linked to our institution and also acknowledging we still need money <laughs> so, that, so that we can exist um, so it, those, it is, it is not easy and it makes us uncomfortable. Um, um, there are so many people whose jobs who are in endowed positions by people who have racist troubling history. So it is, there, there's not an answer you'll get like tomorrow, but I think pressing the questions and the conversations and challenging our spaces is definitely something that needs and should continue to do. So I appreciate that you brought that conversation and hopefully more conversation and perhaps action in some way, shape or form will happen here and at my university and other universities as well. I will say this in closing. We have an exhibition at um, the University of Maryland. It will be coming down soon. I got to, with an amazing team, um, help 
uh, curated collection, uh, an exhibition on the called Rising Up. And it was it's about the history of student activism at the University of Maryland. Um, we, we feel it's like a love letter um, to our students um, because we would not have the, tra the trajectory that our institutions have experienced with creating cultural spaces, um, with having more uh, diverse faculty, staff, and students, like students led that work. Um, and so I say that to say, you are helping lead that work in these conversations. And so I appreciate and always will appreciate, even if it makes us a little, uh, but I appreciate our students when they push us because five years, 10 years from now, Maybe that name will be removed. Maybe that space will be renamed after some amazing person of color that has been has made some contributions in that area. And so, um, just just understand it's it's a long road, and and so just appreciate your work and everyone who does work to to challenge us and and push us to our better selves. So just just say thank you on that. Well. There is a catered reception, um, and I invite everybody to enjoy it and talk to Lael. Thank you. <laughs>